Six good things that keep us from God's best. That's what we're going to be talking about today, one of those things. Uh, we've mentioned this a few times, though, already. It is, uh, it, is, it is spring, spring break week, but spring has finally come, weather-wise, at least here to, to St. Louis. Sorry to the rest of you who might be further up north. Um, but, uh, but it's been good, and hopefully that means you've had a chance to be outside, enjoying outside activity. And I know if you've got younger kids in your house or you've got grandkids, um, that means that you've probably spent time in the last week in a place that looks something like this. You know, in a community like ours, there are half a dozen of these within a one-mile radius, all basically the same, these, these uh, playgrounds. Um, even though they may look a little different, they function the same, very different than the playgrounds I grew up on that were on asphalt, right? Uh, these have this squishy padding stuff or rubber mulch and soft stuff so that if the kids happen to fall, it's, it's, uh, it's good. And you see it's all sturdy, well-built, you know, not too big of spacing and all the rails so no one can get their head stuck and... Uh, the slides are plastic, of course, which means that you'll get about halfway down the slide and you'll need another push to get down the rest of it. Not like the slides that I used to go down where you go so fast that you'd end up on your rear end on the ground or hit your head on the way down. We take our kids to places like this because it's good to get them out of the house, let them run, burn off some energy, have some fun. But, but relatively, we, we understand that relatively it's a, it's a relatively safe uh, environment for them. Now, what I want to show you next is another kind of playground. This is an actual playground, a, a legitimate playground that is designed intentionally for kids in a North Wales neighborhood of the United Kingdom. Take a look at this. So a playground where there's fire and sharp objects and all kinds of rickety stuff stacked up on itself. And, and this is a place intentionally designed for kids to go and play? Are these people nuts? I mean, this would never fly here in the United States. I mean, th there are agencies that simply would not allow it. 
But I want to ask you a question. If, if you were a kid, and maybe some of you are a kid, which playground would you rather play on, really? I mean, the, the nice, clean, tidy one where nothing exciting can happen, or that one where you can do backflips on old mattresses? Look at that kid, upside down in the air. It's amazing. You know, why do I show you all this? Well, because I, I think today we need to rethink some of our ideas about security and protection. Maybe they're not all they're cracked up to be. And uh, in fact, today we're going to look at a story from the Bible, a real story of Jesus and his disciples, where they're in a dangerous situation. And Jesus responds in such a way that also makes me think that, that maybe from God's perspective, safety and security aren't all that they're cracked up to be. We're going to look at that in just a moment, but first I invite you to pray with me. Father, we pray today that you'd speak to us that you'd help us not settle for good things when we can have truly great things. So God, uh, show us how we're settling in life. Open up our minds. Uh, expand our horizons. Uh, I pray that my words would be your words and that our meditation would be, would be good here in this place. More than that, that it would be great, that you would lead us to great things. And I pray you'd be glorified in everything we do. In Jesus, I ask this. Amen. So we're going to go to the book of Matthew. I think it's chapter 8, starting at verse 23. You can look in your own Bible or right here at the screen. Uh, it says, Then he, Jesus got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, while they're out in the water, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, but why are you so afraid? Then he got up, and he rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Tiny story. Uh, we're going to dive into it a little further. But first I just want to give you uh, just some of my initial reactions about this. Now, now remember, many of these guys were fishermen. Many of Jesus' first followers, they, they were fishermen. So they'd spent a lifetime out on boats, on, on lakes just like this, on this very lake even. And so that means either the storm was, was a really bad storm, or these guys were just wimps. I'm going to go with the former, and let's just assume that this was a really bad storm, so bad that these expert fishermen who had spent a lifetime out on the water were terrified for their lives. Uh, second, Jesus is a good sleeper. He's a good little sleeper, isn't he? I've known some people who are good sleepers. My son is one of them, my six-year-old. He can sleep through anything. Um, and yet Jesus here is, is, is outdoing everyone I've ever known. I mean, he's sleeping in the bottom of a boat in the middle of the storm, water lapping over, getting him wet, and he's, he's still sleeping. It's a little weird. Uh, further, another thing that's bizarre here is Jesus' waking reaction. I think that's bizarre. Uh, not the part when he stands up and calms the wind in waves, that makes sense to me. But when Jesus uh, gets woken up by his disciples and he basically insults them, which is something you may do when people wake you up from a dead sleep, but I mean, Jesus does it for another reason. He calls them people of little faith. Uh, literally, it's little faiths. You guys are a bunch of little faith people. And then he says, Why are you afraid? Uh, because the ship's about to sink. That's why we're afraid, right? It, it makes sense. What doesn't make sense is Jesus' reaction. It's, it's a little bizarre. And then lastly, it's clear to me the disciples still don't get it. Because at the end of this, they're amazed. When Jesus stands up and calms the wind and the waves, they're, they're dumbfounded. They're terrified. They're just in awe of what Jesus can do. Now, clearly they don't get it because... They've already spent time with Jesus. They've seen him do some impressive things, some really impressive things. They've seen him do miracles. And yet this still surprises them. And maybe for some of you sitting here today, maybe, maybe you struggle with this stuff too, these, these miracles of Jesus. You're, you're checking Jesus out. You might admire him as a teacher, as a, as a wise person. And yet for you, this idea that Jesus could have command over nature, that seems a little far-fetched to you. And if that's you, that's okay. But here's what I'd say to you today. I'd encourage you to just to keep spending time with Jesus, keep getting to know him better, because as you do, here's what I think will happen to you. You will realize that nothing, nothing is impossible for him. Even calming the wind and the waves. He may even do miracles in your life that will prove it to you. So just like the disciples keep spending time with him, and maybe eventually you'll get it, but at this point in their lives, they still don't get it. Well, what don't they get specifically? One of the things they don't get is, is that protection isn't everything. And I think, frankly, we don't get this either. Because in our culture, security, protection, it is, it is 
of the utmost importance. I may even go as far as saying that security for us is an idol. Our first instinct in life is always safety, protection. And yet, it's not always the best thing. See, the disciples sitting in the boat that day, they, uh, they're crying out to Jesus because they're terrified. But Jesus obviously has a different idea about what's going on. Jesus doesn't have a problem with danger like the disciples do. See, see the disciples don't get that protection isn't everything. There's more to life than protection. And I think we need to get that too. Because for us, even in matters of faith, we think too much of protection. We, we imagine that a person of faith should be a safer person than a person who is not a person of faith, right? So many of us, we come to God for security, and, and you know what? That, that's good. We, we even call our churches sanctuaries, places of refuge or safety. That, that's how we think about this, and, and, and it's good to come to God for safety. One of my favorite Bible verses, one of my favorite Psalms, rather, is uh, Psalm 121, and uh, it, it says this. It says, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And then it goes on and it describes all of the ways that God protects us. So, so clearly protection is good. It's something that God wants us to seek after from him. And yet, it's not God's best for us. And most of us don't understand this. And that's why when hardship comes into life, into our lives, when storms come into our lives, when difficult things happen to us, we often assume that God has failed us somehow. We get angry. We may even lose faith. That's the story of some of us in this room even. So the disciples, they didn't get it. They didn't get that protection wasn't everything. Even deeper than that though, they didn't understand that protection keeps you weak. And I can add the word constant because some level of protection is important, but, but constant protection keeps you weak. Again, I don't think we understand this either. Because there's a growing body of research that says that our obsession with protection and safety is destroying the next generation. Uh, if you're a millennial in the room, I've got to talk about your generation a little bit. And I know these words may not describe you completely. And yet they describe your generation. A, a lot of studies have been written about the epidemic fear of growing up that exists in the millennial generation. That there is a scientifically noticeable um, inability to think for yourself um, in, the millennial, in the millennial generation. In an essay called The Play Deficit, a uh, Boston College psychologist by the name of Peter Gray talks about a rise in depression among millennials, narcissism, and a, and a decrease in empathy. He also notes that there are record numbers of college students who are on psychiatric drugs that has spiked dramatically in recent years. So what's going on with this generation, this generation that is probably the most protected, most well-parented generation in history? Well, one other study called the Children's Independent Mobility Study, uh, this was done in the UK also, they conducted um, a, a survey over kids who grew up in an uh, just a variety of environments, urban, suburban, and rural. And uh, one of the things they discovered is that in 1971, 80% of third graders walked alone to school. So in 1971, 80% of third graders walked alone to school. Some of you may remember being a kid in those days. You had eight, nine-year-olds walking alone to school, 80% of them, the, the vast majority in 1971. The study found that by 1990, that number had dropped to 9%. And today, if you send your third grader to school alone, someone's going to show up on your doorstep, right? Authorities will, because it's just not okay anymore. But, but the study also knows that the level of child abduction through strangers has remained totally flat in the last four decades. You see what this is suggesting? It's, it's saying that all of our hypervigilance isn't paying off. There's no observable change in our safety, even though we're extra vigilant. Another study, uh, and I really like this one, I think, I think it puts a finger on, on this issue. It, it identifies built-in sensory needs that kids have for stuff called risky play. That's what the adventure, uh, or I'm sorry, the land, these adventure playgrounds are all about. The, the author uh, of this study is a woman by the name of Ellen Sandsetter. She's a, a Norwegian. And she talks about how kids developmentally have needs 
for risky things, or at least things they perceive as risky, in order to grow into healthy, well-adjusted adults. In other words, in order to not be weak as adults. Some of the things they need, I'm going to read this list to you. They, they need to explore heights higher than is safe. They need to handle dangerous tools, sharp saws. You know, that kid, I was just waiting for him to hack his arm off when he was trying to cut the cardboard with the saw. Kids need that. Kids need to be near dangerous elements like fire and bodies of water that are too large for them. They need to experience rough and tumble play. They need to experience speeds that are too fast. And they need to explore on their own. And the study notes that, that kids who don't have that, kids who don't ever experience those things, not only will they grow up weak, not only will they grow up narcissistic or psychotic in some other way, but that often these kids will engage in other high-risk behaviors later on in life that are way more dangerous and way more self-destructive to them and the people around them. Do you see, though, we've eliminated most of those six things from our lives and the lives of the people that we love. And that's to our detriment. See, the disciples, they didn't understand that constant protection. I mean, being with Jesus, you would just imagine that you'd be protected all the time. But what Jesus knew that they didn't is that protection can keep you weak. And Jesus needed his disciples to be strong, not weak. Uh, last, the disciples, uh, they, uh, they didn't get that protection is boring. <laughs> it is. Constant protection is boring. Now, again, you need the baseline of protection. But we're built for the need of, of this tension between safety and danger. And if you're in danger all the time, that's not good. But if you're in safety all the time, that's not good either. We long to live life in these, these highly controlled environments, and yet secretly we long for adventure. And that's why, um, you know, like you look at TV shows, the, the old TV show Desperate Housewives. I mean, you live in these, these beautiful neighborhoods and everything's going well. Well, you've got to create drama in your life. Or, or that's why some of you get to 40, 50 years old and, and life's all good and static and all the risk is taken out of life. You've made it and that's why you lose your mind and you buy a motorcycle and you have a midlife crisis, right? Because you, you weren't made to live in protection all the time. You were not designed to live in bubble wrap. Protection is, is boring, it's stifling. You are created with a need for danger and risk. It's good for us. But see, the disciples, they didn't get any of this. And so when the storm comes on them in the water and their lives are threatened, they're freaking out. How can, how can anything good happen if they die out on the sea? But Jesus has a different perspective into all of this. Uh, today what I want to do is I want to go back into that, that uh, narrative from Matthew chapter 8. And I want to look at it again, it's short, from a, from a Jesus' perspective. Trying to understand why Jesus perceived these same events so differently. And I, I want to dig into his perspective a little bit now that we've seen what the disciples might have been. Uh, so we start off again at the top. Then Jesus got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. First thing Jesus understood is Jesus recognized that sudden storms are a way of life. At another point in Jesus' life, he said these words. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. I don't know about you, but if I've ever heard a guarantee, that sounds like one. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. And then he goes on and he says, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. See, I, I don't think we live believing that in this world, we will have trouble. I don't think we believe that constant, uh, that storms rather are a, uh, a, sudden storms are a way of life. I think most of us have been lulled into a false sense of security. We believe that we can manage all the danger away and live a protected life. And, and in fact, what happens to us is that when we hear about awful things, when, when we hear about a tragic car accident, a fatal car accident, what do we do? We say, gosh, that's terrible. But then we think, well, but that's why I never drive over the speed limit, and that's why I drive a very big, safe SUV so that that will never happen to me. Or we hear about a kidnapping, and we think, oh my gosh, that is unthinkable, and it is, but then our next thought is, but that's why I never let my kids out of my sight. Or we hear about a terminal diagnosis, a fatal disease, and we say, oh, that, that's, that's horrible, that's heart-wrenching, but that's why I eat healthy, I don't eat any processed stuff, and I see the doctor every year. We've actually convinced ourselves 
that through, through good planning, through discipline, through wise decision making, that we can mitigate against storms in our life. And that's not true. We can't. You know what? Bad things happen to good people, and bad things happen to very well-prepared people too. You can't control that. Sudden storms can come on you at any moment, and, and they, can, they can shatter, they can just totally disrupt the uh, tranquility of a beautiful day. It happens in life. The disciples didn't understand that. We don't understand that. Jesus understood that. He understood that his whole purpose in being on earth was to face the biggest storm imaginable, that he was going to have to give up his life. He understood it. He made peace with it. We still fight against it. So uh, the storm comes, and this is no surprise to Jesus. Storms happen, and so it says, but Jesus was sleeping. And the disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are going to drown. See, next we learn that Jesus was confident that God wouldn't let him be crushed. Jesus got this. The disciples didn't. They said, we're, we're, we're going to drown. This is going to be terrible. And, and yet Jesus is there sleeping because he seemed to understand that no matter what happened, God wouldn't let him be crushed. In another place, Jesus says, he quotes Isaiah, and he says, a, a bruised reed God will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. What, it, what Isaiah was saying, what Jesus was saying, is that God has set limits around evil. So storms can come into your life, and they can bruise you. They can, they can uh, knock you around. They can cause you to smolder. But God has limited the power of evil in your life so that you cannot be crushed. You will not be snuffed out. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute, but, but people die tragically every day. There are people who are broken and snuffed out all the time, right? You're right. People do die every day. But as Christians, if that's who you are, death is not the same thing as being snuffed out. Death is not the same thing as being broken. The disciples may have drowned that day, but that still means they would not have been defeated or crushed. See, for a Christian, even death doesn't have to be scary for us anymore. Because God has taken death, and death used to be our greatest enemy. I mean, there's still some residual fear over death, because death was our great enemy, and yet God has made that, that enemy into his servant. Death for us is now the means that we get brought into the presence of God. So, so Jesus understood this, and so much of the, the other Christian world outside of the West, where you know we can afford safety for ourselves, they understand this too, that death is not a punishment. That death is not our enemy anymore. That God has made death his servant. And so even in death, we are not crushed. Jesus got that and it changed his perspective. It enabled him to sleep in the bottom of the boat while everyone else was freaking out. To know that even if they were swamped, that's okay. God had this. Uh, then it goes on. It says, Jesus replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves and it was completely calm and then the disciples are amazed. So, so the last thing that we see about, all, about Jesus here is that Jesus believed that God could use anything and everything for his good. The disciples are out there on the boat going, we're, we're going to drown, we're going to die, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. But Jesus understood that in God's hands, God can use anything, anything for good. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You hear that? We know in all things, all things, all things, God can work for the good of those who love him. Yes, all things. Jesus understood that. I don't think we do. We, we know that God can work through the good things. What we don't believe is that God can use anything and everything for our good. See, right here, God is calling us to big faith. He's saying, hey, just believe me, just trust me that I can use anything, even the things that you would think are unimaginable, unthinkable, categorically bad, I can use those for good. In fact, I want to drill down on this a little bit more today because I think this is where we get hung up. I think this is why when we've got choices, you know, between the dangerous playground and the safe one, I believe that this is why we, we tend to gravitate towards safety even though we want to live a different kind of life. We gravitate towards safety over and over again. And I think it's because we, we forget that some of the greatest gifts that God wants to develop in us and give us 
do not come in safety. But instead, they come through the storms of life, through the challenges of life, through danger, and through hardship. And so today, I want to I show you what God can give because he can use anything and everything for good when you take yourself out of constant protection mode. The first is just the gift of wisdom. You know people who are book smart, but they are naive, right? And you know people who are street smart. See, there's a kind of wisdom that God wants to give us that only comes through life and living life and, and going through storms and experiencing hard things. And you can be really smart, you can be really uh, well protected, and you can have a naivete about life um, that, that is just not going to serve you or anyone else very well. See, true wisdom, and I think you might know this, that some of the wisest people that you've ever known, they've lived through some stuff. And that's where their wisdom comes from. See, God wants to cultivate wisdom in your life, and it is a great gift to have wisdom, not just for you, but for others. But it doesn't happen while you're living in a bubble. Next, God wants to give you the gift of adventure. You know, there's two different perspectives here on the storm. The disciples were, of course, you know, cowering and freaking out, but it could have looked different. They could have been standing in the front of the boat going like, Woohoo, Jesus, this is awesome! Because people pay money to do that, right? I mean, on these adventure trips, and people pay money to go up in an airplane and have someone push them out. It's crazy. Uh, we, we love adventure. And so the disciples, they could have seen this as a great adventure, but, but they didn't. Instead, they, they freaked out. God wants to give you the gift of adventure, and, and guess what? Adventure is often living through the storms of life. There is a reason that the World War II generation who was the, the bravest generation, the greatest generation, also a, a great generation financially, did, did really well financially. There's a reason that old World War II guys, when, when they're talking about their life, they don't talk about their investment growth. They talk about life in the foxhole. Why? Because adventure is a gift that God wants to give us. And I remember being a kid, and uh, I was playing out in the woods behind my cousin's house, and we got lost out there. It was a huge woods, and we couldn't find our way back, and, you know, started to panic and freak out and shed some tears even, and and then finally we just decided if, if we could just figure out one way to walk, eventually we'd have to come to something. We, the woods didn't go on forever. And so we, we did that and we saw some telephone poles and we walked toward them and we came out on the way other side of, of his house and had to walk a couple of miles back home. And, and I was like scared and frustrated for a little while. And then I realized this was awesome. Like I'd gotten lost in the woods and I found my way out and I walked home three miles. And of so many of my childhood memories, that's one that stands out. See, it's funny, if you live in constant protection, you live a pretty boring life, you don't get to experience some of the adventures that God wants to give you. You also don't get the gift of growth if you live in constant protection. See, God wants to build character in you. He wants to make you brave and resilient. He wants to make you into a person of depth. But, but again, that, that will not happen living in safety. And you know, as a dad, I, I think about some of this stuff, and I think about my kids, and I don't want to put my kids in a boat and push them out into the water in the middle of a storm. That seems crazy. And yet, I really want them to have some of these things. I, I want them to grow. I want them to be wise. I want them to have adventure. And this challenges my notion that protection is my ultimate responsibility as a parent. It's not. See, lastly, what God wants to give us is the gift of faith. I think when Jesus looks at those disciples as they wake him up and and he calls them little faiths. I think he's giving us a clue there as to, as to what God is doing in allowing this storm to, to come on them. That he's trying to take these guys who are basically people of little faith, and he's trying to make them into people of big faith. But big faith, it doesn't happen in a classroom. It doesn't happen just sitting here listening to messages. That's not how it comes. See, the way big faith comes is when you're living with your back up against the wall, when, you, when you're living outside of your ability to manage life and you cry out to God and you rely on God and you watch God come through for you, that's when your faith explodes. But again, I think most of us, we, we are able, we've got the means and resources and know-how to engineer these pretty safe lives, these lives that we can manage. And so we never experience that, that moment of being out of our league where we have no choice but to cry out to God, to rely on God, and to watch God come through. And for that reason, our faith stays small. See, in short, what if instead of always gravitating toward protection, 
What if instead we were quicker to brave the storms of life? You know what would happen? We would live smarter, more exciting, deeper, and more faith-filled lives. But in order to have that, we've got to stop settling for protection because God wants to give us formation. So what does this look like for us? Just a couple of things. I think there are two quick ways to apply this. The first is brave your next storm. Brave your next storm. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. Sudden storms will come on you in life. We all, I hope, know that. But instead of, when the next storm comes, running for shelter, crying out, trying to escape it, freaking out, stand your ground and brave the next storm that you face. Don't get angry with God. Don't cry out as if something strange is happening to you. It's not. This is life. And as you brave your next storm, God can cultivate all of those things that we just talked about in your life because there's something better than protection. There's formation. And then second, the second thing I want you to do is begin to pray intentionally for formation more than protection. Now, you can still pray prayers of protection, but do this. Every time you find yourself praying a prayer of protection, pray two prayers of formation, okay? Every time you're saying, oh, God, protect or help or give us safe travels, God, form us on this trip. God, form them. You know, pray, pray two for every one because they're both good, but, but one is better. See, there's a reason that hardship um, doesn't crush us in life, and, and that's because God is the X factor in all of this. And I know this may seem scary to be like, well, I'm going to intentionally pray that, that I experience hardship and storms in life. That, that sounds crazy. And, and, and you all know that there are some people who go through hardship and they grow and they're wise and they live adventure and they have a smile on their face and they're deep in faith. And then there are other people who go through hardship and, and they're kind of that smoldering wick who looks like they're about to be snuffed out. And you say, what's the difference? Well, the difference is God. He's the X factor here. See, suffering and hardship and challenges, the storms of life, they don't have any, any real power to make you better, but God does. So today I, I want to end with a story, and the story is, uh, is about a family. Um, just uh, last weekend after this service up here on the platform, I, I was able to baptize three kids, triplets, Kyle, Kerry, Kyle uh, Kara, and Molly, um, three kids, beautiful kids. They're about six years old, just shy of six years old. And uh, on the day they were born, six, almost six years ago, um, they experienced something, their, their mother experienced something that as a, as a husband and as a father is one of, would have to be my worst nightmare. And yet God used even that. I want you to hear this story as a way to embolden you as you face the storms in life. Take a look. Debbie Steffen, I'm from St. Louis, uh, was raised like 15 minutes east of here, um, grew up in this area, went to school. And I'm Ken Steffen, um, I'm originally from New York, uh, I spent my, most of my life there um, and then went into the service afterwards. We were blessed with the news that we were having at least two with a possible third that we would find out <laughs> shortly after whether that was the case. Very excited, you know, obviously for the day that they were going to be born. Um, apprehensive because we also knew that one of our children inside of her was going to have <clears throat> had an issue that was going to require fairly immediate uh, medical procedures after mm -hmm. and that there was going to be a team that was going to be dedicated to the delivery just for, for that one child. We went in late afternoon for the delivery and um, everything went just as the, as the doctors and the teams had said it was going to go. So excited, they were putting the incubators and wheeled off, and it was that time to take Debbie to her, I don't know, whatever you call that, recovery room. Recovery room. And we, her gurney made it about halfway out the door when all of a sudden her body started to go into seizures on the, mm. on the table. And uh, immediately the team that was wheeling around said, wheel her back, wheel her back. Shortly after coming around to that, um, the real, basically blow that devastate, the, the devastated me and the family was hearing the code blue announced over the speakers in the hospital for labor and delivery. Mm -hmm. And then I knew that this was bad. In light of the trauma, so what, what had happened ultimately was um, Debbie suffered what was called an amniotic fluid embolism. 
It's a, a fairly rare occurrence. They have very little data on it because it's so rare, um, but basically it's amniotic fluid going into the body instead of exiting it and going to the organs and causing basically all of her major organs to shut down almost instantaneously. But what happened afterwards, what we were blessed with afterwards, it's hard to give that up, uh, thinking that there's a good chance that we would have never experienced what we got to afterwards in, in the way of relationships and what we got to see, the good in the world that we struggled to see beforehand. What really just, I guess you could say, blew us away was the amount of people that came to the call. We had a, a friend, friends, but a friend specifically, Karen Malonoff and, and her husband Craig, that you know, basically kicked into gear and organized the whole plan of how people would come to our aid as far as, you know, knowing that we were going to be dealing with hospital issues, dealing with eventually having to bring the kids home but not knowing what was going to happen with her, have people bring food to our houses, help take care of things that needed to be taken care of around the house. There were hundreds of people that came to help us, and I didn't know about any of it until like six months down the road, and they were still coming around the clock, even six months after the babies had been born. Out of those people, there's still many that came that we are still very close with. But like Debbie said, yeah, the friendships that formed that formed for the length of time. In fact, you talked about the baptism. The sponsor of, the, of our three children for this weekend is one of those that volunteered to help us, and that we formed a, uh, she's basically family now, and we have others that we call family too as well that came out of that. So that's what I mean by, and just seeing that amount of good, it, made, it turned my life around to realize that, yeah, well, the news may not show it, but there is actually a lot of good out there, and there's a lot of people who will do good and, and do good things, so uh, it certainly helped turn, turn me around. <laughs> well, they, they gave up so much of their time to come help us for such a long time. I mean, I don't think there was, there was anybody that didn't devote a full year of, of their life to coming, mm -hmm. at, you know, every Wednesday from 9 to noon, um, you know, it was just like clockwork. They, and this was around in. the clock. I mean, we had people that were sleeping over our house to help us. We still have plenty of challenges ahead of us, um, you know, just in the fact of the raising the four kids, but um, Debbie still has illnesses that resulted as the form, you know, as the result of that trauma that she went through. But what's incredible is when you form those relationships that you have, it, it's so much less scarier knowing that you've got that kind of support network that you feel very confident would come to your aid yet again. Isn't it incredible what God can do? I mean, isn't it? <laughs> I, thought, I thought Ken's line in there was especially poignant. He said something like, you know what, this is this unthinkable thing he's going through. And he says, but what happened afterward it would be hard to give that up, that, that even though they face this huge storm in life that has brought all kinds of complication and difficulty, he can still say, but because of God, because of who God is, because God can use anything, because of the formation that God has worked through this whole, uh, this whole ordeal, it would be hard to go back and to say, let's erase that bad spot in our lives because of what God did. I, I hope that gives you courage to brave your next storm whenever it comes. And I hope that gives you courage to begin praying for formation, seeking after formation for yourself and for those you love more than protection. Please stand. Uh, today we're going to close by coming to communion and just receiving God's love and favor for us again, his strength and power. Before we do that, I invite you to bow your head with me as we, uh, as we confess and I lead you in a prayer of confession. Father God, we come to you acknowledging that we are fearful that too often in life we are cowardly. We see the storms coming and we see the hardships and the challenges and, and we freak out, we get angry, we doubt your goodness. We may speak against you. God, we confess all of that. God, we also confess that we are too quick to live comfortable, safe, protected lives. When instead you call us to live lives of impact, lives of meaning and significance for others. Sometimes we, we refuse to because we're too busy trying to stay safe, trying to eliminate risk. And so we fail to, to be your church the way you want us to be. We fail to live lives that you want us to live. God, forgive us. God, for all of our sins, we ask that you would forgive us, that you would 
make us clean, that you would make us new, that you'd wash our sins away, that you'd form us like only you can do, that you'd give us the greater gifts. Forgive us for the times that we settle for good when you offer us great. God, uh, forgive us and help us to choose wisely in the future. We thank you for your love and forgiveness. We thank you for Jesus who braved a cross knowing that you can use anything for good. And God, we thank you that you turned that cross, that, that instrument of torture, that instrument of shame, that you turned that into our glory, to our rescue. God, thank you for Jesus and for what he's done. We pray this in his strong name. Amen.